الحسن والحسين الثالثة إلى روح سيدتنا ومولاتنا فاطمة بالله من الشر الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي اما بعد respected scholars elders brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Of the stance of Imam Hussein alayhi salam on the 10th of Muharram and Sayyidah Zainab on the 11th, one of the main faculties and pillars of Islam that is identified and practiced to show us the importance that it holds within the religion of Islam and within the message that Abu Abdullah tried to install in his sacrifice on the 10th of Muharram is the upholding of his prayers. And Salat is one of the main aspects that Imam Hussein was martyred on the 10th of Muharram and one of the most important messages that he tried to instill. So inshallah tonight is dedicated to looking at the pillar of Salat we're going to look at it in a number of stages. First, we look at Salat in its importance. What has the Prophet said about the pillar of Salat? What has our Imams stated about the importance of Salat? Then we want to look at the faculty of Salat. What does it try to instill in the person? What merits may it give you? What characteristics does it try to instill in a person's everyday life? After looking at that, we want to look at another hadith by Imam al-Askar. We'll end it with a couple of stories of Salat, one in particular that happened well after the Imam's time. To give you an idea, and by the end of tonight we'll have grasped a better understanding, insha'Allah, of Salah. To start, please, loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam states that the difference, the difference between a mu'min and a kafir <coughs> is salah. Look at the detail of that narration, brothers and sisters. The difference, the difference between a Muslim, a mu'min, and a kafir is his salah. Look at the epitome of importance within the religion of Islam. When our Imams come forth and state, if your salat is accepted, then all your other deeds are accepted. It's put as the pillar of the tent that keeps everything together. That's the idea that the Imams and the Prophets tried to instill in the idea of Salah. When we will look at this, is it suffice that if someone comes forth and say, I give, I give charity. I were to give my homes, I would give everything so there was the religion of Islam, I would pay my zakat, I would fast, yet I'm a bit negligent with my prayers. If we look at that, we say, refer to the hadith of the prophets. They say, if your prayers is not accepted, then everything else is likewise. Whereas if your prayers are accepted, then every other deed will be accepted. Now why is it, someone may come forth and ask, that prayers are put such importance. Why is it so important that the idea of prayer five times, five prayers, three times a day, why is it? Now we look at the actual idea of prayer. What does prayer in itself try to instill in a person? Now, ulama come forth with a couple of 
points, he said, first and foremost, he tries to install the idea of discipline. What do I mean the idea of discipline? If you were, as an example, that's always given, about to have a meeting, an important meeting, an interview with a company, or a job interview, we find that you are ready. Not one day, not one hour prior, you find you get yourself ready one week before. You'd read upon PDFs upon PDFs of how to act in this particular interview. How to dress. Do I put too much cologne? Or do I put too little? What are the aspects that I have to come forth with and acknowledge prior to this interview? With a slave of God. Now what kind of ideas do we think about when we're coming towards an interview when Allah calls us, which is the prayer? That's what we have to think about. If you, if we can come forth in an interview for someone that's a slave of God, a creation of God, and put it of the utmost importance because he has a bank balance higher than ours and he's about to offer us some money, then where is where is our interview-related preparation when we are standing in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He says, I try to teach you discipline with praise. I tell you to be ready five times, five salat. He says, three times in a day I call you. Can you answer my call when I call you? Are you prepared 5, 10, 15 minutes prior? Do you leave all of what you are doing and go towards Allah when He is calling you or do you not? Put that into perspective, the idea of discipline. That's what He's trying to instill in first and foremost. The ulama on a second level tried to say that Salah tried to teach us humbleness. How does Salah teach us humbleness, someone may ask. Now, if you look at the example of Iblis, we said a couple of nights ago, Iblis was known as Tawus al the peacock of the angels. He was not an angel, but he was given this title because of how much of a relationship he had with Allah, how much he was in prostration towards Allah, as we stated. That he in narration prayed for 6,000 years. 6,000. That's nothing compared to what me and you pray. 6,000 years of prayer. In another narration, we said that 6,000 years was one of his sujuds. One. Now let's compare if these, let's compare Shaitan to us nowadays. It takes us about the maximum 20 seconds. That's on the last sujood. When we can try to extend this for a bit. Now imagine, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Iblis bow down before Adam. Was he humble in doing so? Or did he have arrogance? Did he go against the message of Allah, against his direct orders to prostrate? That's when the ulama come forth and say, he's trying to teach you humbleness. Humble yourself. Why? When the Arabians come to the Prophet of Islam and they ask him, O Prophet of Islam, you said that we should fast. We agree, we shall fast. Not a problem. You said give charity. He said, not a problem. We'll give charity. We'll give from our wealth. He said, pay taxes. Pay your homes. Pay 20%. Not a problem, we will pay it. But this idea of prostration and praying, we do not accept it. Notice the idea of humbleness, brothers and sisters. The Prophet asks this man, he says, why is it? Why is it that you do not want to pray? Why is Salah such a burden? Why is it such a burden to you? Now look at the answer of this Arabian. He said, oh Rasulullah, I cannot bear to think what the Arabs will think of me when my backside is at a higher level than my head. Humbleness. 
when you are submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the state of ruku and in the state of sujood you are at a state of submission total submission when Imam Zayn al-Abidin says in his narration it says that if you only knew the rewards that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bestowing upon you in sujood you would never lift your head from sujood now imagine, imagine what bounties you get in the state of sujood. Imagine Zayn al Abidin himself, what does he do? In narrations, he would prostrate, thanking Allah when someone would come forth with a question to ask him, or any calamity, any trial. Imam Zayn al Abidin would be in prostration. Saying shukran lillah, shukran lillah, shukran lillah. Thank you, O oh Allah, thank you, O oh Allah, thank you, O oh Allah. That you have blessed me with this trial. You have blessed me with a person asking about the religion. That you have blessed me with sickness. You have blessed me with anything. He would be in prostration before and after. Zayn al Abidin was given the title Sayyid al Sajidin. Why? Because of this very act. Because of this very act, when he's asked, he says, why and what status do you have? What status do you have amongst the Ahlul Bayt? Such a magnanimous figure when it comes to prostrating before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when it comes to the link between you and Allah, what does he reply? He says, my, my actions he says, my actions are not a dot in the ocean of the bounties of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, all this that I have, that I do, not a drop in the ocean of the bounties of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now imagine what kind of figure Ali ibn Abi Talib was. And we said, if we took a majlis every single night for a year, we would not even touch upon what kind of a figure Ali ibn Abi Talib was, the door to the Prophet of Islam. When in Bukhari it states, it states if the oceans were ink and the trees were the pens and the jinn and the humans on this earth, how many? Six billion? Six billion? Seven billion? Humans? Jinn are ten times us. They were all the writers of the bounties of Ali ibn Abi Talib. It states that it would not be enough ink, meaning there would not be water enough in the oceans to count the merits of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Imagine what kind of a figure he was. But when he tried to instill salah, he took it on himself first and foremost until he was struck in the mihrab, in a state of prostration, in a state of submission to Allah. And when he is struck, what does he say? He says, I am victorious. He says, I am victorious. In a state of prostration. The idea of salat, when we look at every single imam's life, we find what? That every single Imam before he passes, he says to the Imam after him, do not forget the prayers. When Imam Sa'ad brings all his relatives and all his sons and daughters, he brings his family together. And the dying words of Imam Sa'ad, what does he state? He says, our intercession, Shafa. He says, our intercession will not reach those that take their prayers lightly. <coughs> our intercession, we pride ourselves on being Shia of Ahlul Bayt and we have the idea of intercession on the day of judgment. Imam Sadiq says, you will not receive our intercession if you take your prayers lightly. Now when he says lightly, what does he mean? 
Does he mean that I leave it for Qada and I pray it with Dhuhr and Asr? Do I leave it Dhuhr and Asr, leave it for what? Leave it for Maghrib and Asha, pray it Qada. Is that what taking it lightly means? Of course not. Lightly in ulama come forth and state lightly is if you leave it after 15, 20 minutes of when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls you. When Adhan takes place, that's 15, 20 minutes after, that's taking the praise light. We're not leaving it for Qadha. We are at the majlis of Abu Abdullah. And we learn that he stood for Salat. Yet most people neglect the idea and the importance of Salat. And it's, be it's beyond comprehension the importance and the role it plays within the life of each and every one of us because when you pray your prayers between the prayers Allah states if you're praying between the prayers it will not let you sin because in it in itself stops you from sinning. He says, if you know or you want to know if your prayers are being accepted or they are not being accepted, look at what you do between the prayers. Look at what you do between the prayers. And you will know there and then if your prayers are accepted or if it has not even reached the first sky. If it's not even reached the first sky. You will know, brothers and sisters. Now the turba in itself, Imam Hussein, the difference between a normal turba, is a beautiful narration, and the turbas, and the turba of Aba Abdullah. There are nine stages for a salat to be accepted. In jurisprudence, there are nine stages in which your prayers will be accepted. When you pray on the dust, on the turba of Aba Abdullah. It takes you from the niyyah and it excels all nine stages and it is accepted. That's the barakah of the turba of Aba Abdullah. Salah ala Muhammad. Now, when we open the TV and we see someone, I don't want to mention his name. He's not deserving that I mention it on the pulpit of Abba Abdullah, but he comes forth and says, Do not pray in the masjids of the Shia. Why? Isn't it a masjid? Isn't it Baytullah? Why is it that you should not pray in the masjid of the Shia? He says, It has turba. It has the turba of Abba Abdullah. This is haram. This is bid'ah. This is bid'ah. A person replied to him. A person comes forth. He replies to him. He says, look in your own books. Is praying on the turba bid'ah or is praying on the mat? He takes the references. I don't have time to go through all of them. In the references, he says, look at the book of Ibn Taymiyyah. 20 22nd booklet, page 165. He says, anyone that pray, prays on the mattress and does not pray on the dirt, that's bid'ah. Do they mention this, brothers and sisters? Amongst many narrations, in Bukhari and Muslim, it says, the Prophet used to pray on rocks. Nowhere in history or nowhere in the Hadith books does it say he prayed on mats. Nowhere in history. Everywhere you look, if you find me one narration that says the Prophet prayed on mattresses, we will take the turba away. There is not one narration in any book from the strongest of hadith reciters to the weakest of them. Not one that says the Prophet prayed on a mat. Whereas everything we find the Prophet prayed on rocks. We have narrations that the Prophet smelt the dust of Abba Abdullah in Kabbalah. And he says, my grandson will be 
blood will be mixed with this soil one day and it will be of the utmost importance. That's the Prophet of Islam. <coughs> Going back on the topic of prayers, I leave you with a story. And then we want to look at Abdullah al because it's his night tonight. There is a beautiful story that happened not too long ago. In Europe, there was a young man. Sheikh's narrating this. He says, I went on this bus and I'm wearing my turban and I had my garments on, so I felt very nervous being around everyone with the tight shirts and the spiky hair. <laughs> he says, do not think, he's telling us, do not let looks deceive you, brothers and sisters. Just because someone has a particular haircut, wears a particular type of shirt, has a particular tightness, do not begin to judge them because they would very well can be better than you in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says, I learned this then and there. He says, I went on this bus. I sat next to a young man that had a tight shirt and he had a spiked hair. He said, as we were going, I recognized that it was going to be near Salah time. So he says, I, I thought to myself, we're on a journey. When we get to our destination, I'll pray it Allah. He said, Salah time hits. As soon as Salah time hit, he said, this young man jumps. And he runs towards the driver. He said, stop the bus now. He said, stop the bus. He says, no, we're on a route. We can't stop. He says, you have to stop. I need to get off. And I'm thinking this argument. So he got up, goes to the man. He says, what is this? He says, it's Salah time, Mawlana. We have to get off. We have to pray. And he's thinking to himself, I'm thinking I should just let it be. Don't worry about Salah time now. Until we stop. Then I can pray to Allah. He says, this young man. So he interested me. He said, what is it? After he got off the bus and he prayed, he said, what is it that made you get up? He said, it's a beautiful story that happened to me and I will never forget it. And this is why I created a relationship such as the relationship I have with Allah. He said, what happened? He said, I had a grandmother that used to always teach me about Sahib al-Asr wa zaman She tried to teach me and teach me. I'd never listened to her. She said, one day in my final test of medicine, my final test, do or die, I failed this. Five years gone down the drain. I passed this and I'm a doctor. He said, on my last trip to the exam on a bus, he said, the bus stopped. A couple of minutes before my exam. He said, the bus stopped. What's the matter? There's a pop tire. He says, is there any way you can fix this? Call someone, get another bus. I'm late to my exam. He says, nothing. He says, I was at a state of need. I was in a state of need. He says, do or die. He says, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, what should I do? What should I do? He says, in my head it popped, my grandmother used to tell me, whenever you need something, say, Ya Sahib al zaman Ya Sahib al zaman He said, I did not know who she was talking about. So imagine his religiosity level, if you did not know the Sahib, Sahib al Asri was zaman But to give you an idea of how a person may change. He said, he did not even say Ya Sahib al zaman he said, Ya Sahib zaman Jaddati. Ya Sahib Zaman, Jaddati. Please help me and I will never neglect my prayers. He made an oath with Allah. He said, do not leave me. He says, do this for me and I will never neglect my prayers. He says, I have not finished my sentence. I look towards the driver and he says, get on, get on. We're moving again. He said, what is it? He says, a man came, fixed the tire, and he left. Now we're on our way. Salah ala Muhammad. That's 
person narrates this and he says, this man I saw in his eyes, the dedication that he had towards his prayers, and I knew this to be true. Now, if we were to put this into our perspective, brothers and sisters, if we take an oath to understand why Imam Hussain stood the stance that he took in Karbala and understand that Salat was one of the pillars that he tried to install and tried to apply this in our life. Imagine how successful we shall be, brothers and sisters. Allah guarantees this. The Imams guarantee this. When Imam Hussein alayhi salam on the 10th of Muharram, on the 10th of Muharram, he says to his Sahaba, he says, come, it's prayer time. Now we must pray. He says, we're in the midst of war. He says, is this not why? Is this one? Is this why? Or is this not why we're taking this stance against these people? It is, is it or is it not to install the prayers? When Imam Ali and Safin is stopped and he's seen looking after fighting someone, killing them, he'd look up, he'd hit another, he'd say Allahu Akbar, he'd look back up in the sky, his Sahaba would say, why? Ali ibn Abi Talib, are you looking towards the skies? He said, I'm looking at the sun to look at when it's time to pray. He said, you're in the midst of war. A person may come and strike you as you're looking up. He said, is this why? Is this not why we are fighting in the first place? To instill Sada. Is this or is it not why? The stance that Imam Hussein took and what he tried to install takes place. And the people on the opposing army of Imam Hussein will take this opportunity. When Imam Hussein is praying, he said, now is the great chance. Kill them. Use the arrows and kill them where many of the Sahaba died protecting the Imam whilst he was in prayers. Look at the importance of Salah, brothers and sisters. That's the importance of Salah. Sayyida Zainab, after all this calamity befell her, all these calamities befell, and Sayyida Zainab took everything on board, everything, yet still you find that Salat al on the 11th of Muharram was still taking place. Look at the importance, look at the importance of Salah. That's what this family tried to install, brothers and sisters. This is a vital message that you have to take from Ashura. Salat. When Imam Hussein goes towards the army and he asks them, he says, why is it that you fight me? Is it for a halal that I have made haram? Is it for a haram that I have made halal? Have I done anything? Now look at the reply and it shall show you the importance and the character of Imam Hussein and what he stood for and what the opposing army stood for from this very sentence, brothers and sisters. He says, why is it that you fight me? Have I done anything? They say, no. You have done nothing wrong. He says, why is it that you fight me then? He says, Bukhdan li abik. In hatred to your father, Ali ibn Abi Talib. Imagine the person that the Prophet of Islam takes his hand and says, look at this beautiful narration. He says about Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, if it was not for the idea that some of my ummah will say about you what the Christians said about Jesus, son of Mary, I, have, I would have said a sentence that the people will take from the dust of your feet and from your ablution. Water and dust that they will take as barak. 
لولا أن تقول فيك طائفة من أمتي ما قالته النصارى في عيسى بن مريم لقلت فيك كلمة لا تمر بها على ملأ إلا وأخذوا من تراب عليك ومن طهورك ما يستشفون به ولكن حسبك أنك مني وأنا منك وشيعتك على منابر من نور مبيضة وجوههم حولي في الجنة وهم جيراني says if it was not for that I would have said that word these people come forth and say we fight you on the sole reason for Ali being your father imagine these people and what they stood for Now we move on from Salat to the man or the baby that we commemorate tonight, brothers and sisters. Now imagine, I want you to imagine, this is the night of the 10th of Muharram. Imagine this household and the sacrifices they put forth, giving up their lives, giving up their families, giving up their six-month-old baby. After everyone died, Imam Hussein goes into the tent and sees Abdullah al -Rabir. He takes this six-month-old. Imagine now a six-month-old was to cry, brothers and sisters. Would that not make your heart soft? It would soften your heart looking at him cry, saying, how can I help him? Now imagine Abba Abdullah takes the beautiful and pure six-month-old baby Russian say fluttering his hands and legs from the thirst that he was in his mother did not have milk and her tears did not they were dry and she not, could not even give him the teas as a source of nutrition imagine what kind of status they were in brothers and sisters now he takes him and goes towards the people, the enemies of Islam, the enemies of Allah, and says, if there is a sin that we, the adults, have committed, then what sin is for this six-month-old baby? What sin is for this six-month-old baby? He says, give him, take him. He left him on the floor. He said, take him. He picks him up again and he says, feed him. Conscious thirst, six month old. Amongst the armies, they would say, some would say, feed him. Give him the water. And the others would say, no. They're from the household of Islam, the household of the Prophet. So he says, take an arrow, and not any arrow, brothers and sisters. There was arrows and there were three pointed arrows that they used to kill the camels. Imagine what arrow that was. And he strikes that arrow. And he hits where brothers and sisters? The neck of Abdullah Rabia in the father's hand. In the father's hand. Six months old fluttering his final final movements as an arrow just pierced his neck. Imam Hussein takes it. Now this is not the tragedy, brothers and sisters. I want you to listen carefully. This is the tragedy that befalls afterwards. After he buries him, he never buried any of his companions. And there's a reason. He buries Abdullah al -Radiyya. And after everything happens on the 10th of Muharram, after he's martyred, say it to Shuhada. They come, they burn the tents. The Fatimiyat are running left, right and center, all the children. And they're about to take off. They're about to take off. Shimon sees that everyone's gone, yet there is one tribe that stood in Karbala. They would not move, he said, we're not coming with you. He says, why is it that you do not come with us? The tribe say what? Look at this, look at the people that fought the message of Islam, brothers and sisters. He say every single person, 
Every tribe will go towards Yazid and they have a head on a spear. Each tribe have a head on a spear. So she was thinking I beheaded all the Imam's family. Every single one of them, their heads is on a spear. Where is it am I going to get a head and put it on a spear for this tribe? So he finds a lump in the tent of Abba Abdullah. And he digs that. And he digs. And who does he find? Who does he find? Abdullah al -Radiyya. A six month old baby. He takes him. He beheads him. The six month old. I don't even know how he fit the head on his feet. He puts it on his feet. And he goes and he gives it to that tribe. He says, Oh tribe, are you suffice? They say, Yes, yes. Now we can go towards Yazid and say, What? That we have a head, we fought the war with the head of Abba Abdullah and the head of the six month old baby Abdullah al -Rabi. Just to give you an idea, brothers and sisters, of what kind of people fought the message of Islam. We pray to Allah, brothers and sisters, that He writes us amongst those that did not neglect their prayers. So we may, so we may take the intercession of our Imams on the Day of Judgment. We pray to Allah that He raises us with Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. We pray to Allah that He writes that we are one of the Shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib. We pray to Allah that we are written amongst the soldiers of Imam Sahib al Asri wa Zaman. We pray with the Fatiha. But before it, the loudest salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad.